kind of mixed up. And, and um, you know, uh, people think that being innovative is about taking big risks and uh, you know spending huge amounts of money. Um, where, in the words of Vincent Van Hook, great things are done by a series of small things brought together a lot of the time. Now, um, at the absolute core of our consulting is an understanding that there are a minimum of five different sorts of wine businesses that you could potentially have. They really have nothing to do with one another in terms of how you must grow the grapes, how you must make the wine, the paths to market you need, and the conversation you need to be having with a customer. And you can say that either you're in the commodity business, you're in the grocery business, you're in the image and lifestyle business, or God forbid you're actually in the wine, food and travel business. Uh, and then there is this um, specter of luxury brands that people like Treasury Wine Estates are so interested in. I mean, clearly people who would rather collect wine than drink it are a, a very different group of people altogether. Now, if you think about how um, the lead consumer group has evolved over time, as you can sort of think of it as a, as a pig going through the python, as they say, if you think back to the 1980s where brands were big and so was hair, and you can think about names like Blue Nun and Black Tower and Matus Rosé. In order to be successful in those times, all you needed was a name that no one would ever forget and a bottle that people couldn't miss, and then you were pretty much set. The 1990s was really the advent of the branded wine business, which is something that the Australians did incredibly well at. I was in a ballroom in 1991 when Brian Crozer, a.k.a. God at the time, announced to the assembled congregation that Australia would sell a billion dollars worth of wine by the year 2000. I mean, we all thought he was crazy. We thought he was high on his own supply or something. But with four months to spare, Australia did manage to achieve that goal. But what a lot of people don't understand is that um, he and his colleagues at his company sold most winemakers in Australia um, the same yeast. And this whole spectre of the flying winemaker that Australians were so proud of in the 1990s wasn't really about innovative winemaking. It was about um, cellar hygiene as much as anything else. And then, um, you know, Crozer um, gave the world um, vanilla and chocolate. He told everybody, basically, to plant Chardonnay and Cabernet. Um, so what did that actually mean? Well, it meant that um, Australia managed to standardise, commoditise, and sterilise wine. You know, there's some true innovative genius. There you have a, a grocery category, essentially, and Australia had massive success off the back of it. But then a customer came along that the Australian wine industry didn't see coming, and that is this confident customer um, who maybe doesn't know so much about wine but knows what she likes. And, you know, that meant that Australia lost 40% of its white wine industry to Marlborough Sauvignon Blanc. That meant that wine styles like Pinot Grigio in, in the US and Malbec in the US were able to conquer all because this was really the consumer starting to drive things. In the time that we're in now, it's all about wines of provenance, about the winemaker, it's about um, handcrafting and it's about the care that people take. That's what drives what's on wine lists. That's what drives what's in better bottle shops. That's where all the growth and the money is in the market right now. And that caused me to ask late last year, well, what's next? Is it going to be those brands with great heritage, you know, like the Antonori's that date back to the 14th century? Are those brands going to be next? Well, interestingly, we, we did any research into what's on wine lists in Australia, the UK, Canada, and other markets. And, uh, you know, Tyrrell's, which really is the oldest, crustiest brand, you could say, um, in New South Wales, all of a sudden is the most popular. Likewise, De Bortley's, um, one of the oldest producers, operational and selling wine uh, in Victoria, number one in that market. Cullen's, fantastic brand out of Margaret River, uh, number two, but on a rocket. And, uh, again, just uh, forgive the alignment there of... Uh, uh, the titles there, but we see exactly the same thing happening in the US. Uh, I love this brand, Concrete. Uh, and um, it reminds me of 
touring Settles Field in South Australia, um, you know, 20 or 30 years ago, and it just been a, a bunch of old concrete mats with nothing but dust in them. Now, of course, they're the height of fashion, reused again as open bat fermenters. And you see the Sebastiani family uh, with this La Tetoza brand and the monks and the old hand operated presses and the open bats and so forth. The minor concern about this is that, you know, it's, it's very easy to start believing that the present is somehow um, the past reimagined, that really this is just the impact of major global trends. And, and I see another possible future. I see, you know, wine as, as art as a real possibility. And whenever I show this picture in the workshop that I run, you know, reactions are very mixed. But I, I think this is truly brilliant. I think this is pushing some great um, buttons here. I grew up in a gold rush town. California is pretty much a, a gold rush town. And, you know, how much joy is there in finding a five cent piece down the back of the couch or an old Chinese medicine bottle or, or whatever. So some very, very um, subtle messages coming through, but nothing subtle about uh, the price that they were able to sell this one SKU. Four. So to me, that, that's really clever. So you might look at that and say, well, look, if, if that's the way the market's turning and that's the sort of stuff that people are doing, why do I want to get in and, and get involved with doing that sort of stuff? Well, my answer is that I've been looking at charts of wine prices in markets for 30 years and they always look like this. You know, there's always a peak at the front. If you look at the American wine market at the moment and you look at the over $20 sector, and its growth rate, it looks exactly like that. It's where the money is, basically. And, you know, after working for businesses like, you know, Yellow Tail and Wine Marlborough and, um, you know, Freshnet and so forth, you learn very quickly that moving with momentum is just one hell of a lot easier than trying to fight it. Uh, but the other reason, of course, is that profits may dry up in the channels that you're in and you might get left high and dry. So um, if we now look at each one of those business sectors and what's going on in them and ask, well, how could we innovate to be successful? I think there's some interesting options because if you look at the beverage wine sector, I'm basically talking about everything under about seven bucks. I mean, there's a lot of opportunity in China and developing markets, but in mature markets like the US, it's a very, very tough game dominated by a small number of players and supermarkets are really looking to own it. But I look at this, this is some packaging from um, the coffee sector, and I just thought, wow, you know, it, there's an opportunity in wine, I think, through packaging to tell the story of, you know, our dirt, our vines, our earth, our history, uh, without using words, because there's not time for that on the supermarket shelf. And I think that if those sorts of techniques were used, then there could be some possibility. What about the branded wine sector? Well, basically, in markets like the UK and Australia and the on-premise, um, they just don't want um, in Folds, Jacob's Creek, Yellow Tail, Gallo, Conchigatoro, um, whoever. There's no place. The North American market at this stage is quite different because you have this sector of chain restaurants, and if you pay your money away to go, Canadian monopoly is much the same, and some of those markets you don't get on restaurant wine lists and buy them and offer them. But in other markets, it means that there's more power going to the supermarkets, that brands are getting targeted by own label. And those people with low cost manufacturing supply chain and the skills to manage the grocery category are winning. You know, every year Marvin Shankin puts out a report showing Gallo key brands growing in double digits every year. Um, Hardy's in the UK grows in double digits, which means that if you're in a shrinking category and you're a small player, then you're in a tough place. But nothing is beyond challenging. I mean, you've only got to look at Yellow Tail's success in the US. And every day when I'm walking down the grocery aisle, I see categories that are being disrupted. And I think one of the biggest disruptions and one of the most relevant uh, is with tea. I mean, have a look at how different tea is today compared to 10 years ago. Remember that stuff that looked like it was ground up in the bottom of your boot? I mean, look at it now. Look at those individual leaves and the little bits of citrus and the little pyramid it sits in. 
this um, guy always has my admiration, Meryl Fernando, is this company, Dilma, has disrupted the tea category and has become a, an important brand around the world in the aisles where he sits. But have a look at what he's doing. You know, he's stealing our stuff. He's got our aprons. He's got our glasses. He's got our presentation techniques. So I was thinking, well, what would happen if we could steal a bit back from tea? <clears throat> I was thinking, imagine if we had their decanters. Imagine if we had their gift boxes, where everything was pre presented as exquisitely as what the tea people do it. I mean, imagine if we even had the ways to present our raw materials as attractively as what the tea people do. I mean, this is a random Google search that I did for tea. I did not stick these images together. <laughs> this is not contrived as exactly what I saw. And have a look at it. I mean, you know, tea is English, tea is Chinese, tea is Japanese, above all, tea is Sri Lankan. You know, tea um, is comfortable and every day. Tea's, tea's for a special occasion. Tea is great with different infusions. Tea's dynamic. And of course, in the corner, I bloody love tea. If you look at wine, by comparison, and again, you know, this is just a random Google image search. I mean, have a look at it. I mean, obviously, there are a lot of North American food photographers who don't drink. You know, those are not wine glasses. Those are not wine grapes. That's not how you pour a glass of wine. I wouldn't want to drink anything out of that cask, would you? I wouldn't try and open a, any sort of decent bottle of wine with that corkscrew. I mean, it just looks unloved, doesn't it? So I think as far as branded wine goes, there's still opportunities to break through with, um, you know, Better packaging, branding, product development, and so forth. There's a lot of room there. Now, for most of you, um, you'll be more interested in these next categories. And I think for the aspirational wine consumer, that's anybody who sort of likes the idea of wine generically but isn't a massive wine nerd, then there are huge, huge um, opportunities. And I think you've really got to think about your brand like a fashion brand, and, and that's where the opportunities are. I mean, someone who I visited recently who I think really gets this is Ramscape Winery out of Canaris. I mean, you look at this and you see, you know, it's exactly like a really swank um, San Francisco nightclub. And there's not a great deal of pretense. The, the people are wonderful. But you get the very clear message that if you really want to be part of this brand, you pay the small premium, then you get access to the exclusive areas, then you get to drink the good stuff. And away you go. So to me, that's really symbolizes what a great um, aspirational brand is about. And nobody's understood this better recently uh, than the Chambonois. I mean, you look at this and it just blows my mind. I mean, I remember running workshops in South Africa and having the attendees say, well, you know, our old classic brands, you know, we just couldn't touch them, could we? And you look at that and you think, well, yeah. <laughs> You think about how crude looked five or ten years ago compared to that um, midnight blue number. Um, really beautiful, isn't it? But when you look at Prosecco, which really is the fastest growing wine idea on the planet um, right now, you can really see um, why they win through taking a lot of that um, inspiration and selling it at price points that people can relate to on an everyday basis. But the biggest opportunity I see of all is um, for innovation as far as the actual wine styles themselves go. I mean, you can't go to a winery in South Africa where they don't have a chocolate, a mocha, a toffee, a coffee, a uh, wine of some sort or other. If you take the national variety, uh, Pinotage, and the three biggest selling wines, all three of them are what they call coffee Pinotage. They're wines that have been manipulated to taste a particular way. This wine, I think, is the best example of the lot. It's called the Chocolate Block. I mean, it's, it's been engineered, of course, to taste like chocolate. Uh, and it's a serious wine. You know, it's $25, which is an okay price in the US market, but a fortune in the South African market, and it's a 30,000 case wine brand. But taking that one step further, well, I guess one of the hottest things in the wine world at the moment is infusions, but I don't know about you, but I kind of look at that and I feel a bit ill 
uh, the large companies tend to always do this, to take an idea and take it right down to the lowest common denominator and sell it for five bucks in a supermarket. I think as far as this drinker goes, there's massive opportunity if you want to give them some respect. Now, one thing I haven't seen done yet, I haven't seen, for example, honey added. This is a honey vodka in picture here, but honey's been added to every other drinks category. Why not wine? Why not botanicals? Why not healthy ingredients that use to get it, create a, a grown-up flavour profile? That's a space that's no one, that no one's really um, looked to challenge, where I still see a great opportunity. So putting in the fourth gear, as it were, and, and talking about innovating where actual wine is concerned at the top end, well, I think there's a lot of possibilities still for all reasons to tell their terroir story. Um, I often use this in presentations. This is actually in the Hunter Valley, and I think there are people from the Hunter Valley that wouldn't even know that this is the sort of scenery and soils and that real red earth. Uh, that people wouldn't necessarily associate with the region. All um, regions have got these hidden gems. It's just a matter of telling the story and telling it visually is most important. The same with your whole organic biodynamic uh, story. Um, you know, people love these good for the earth messages. You've got to be able to tell the story in a way that will have people remember you. Now, the little guy who's sitting the cat down in the right hand corner um, may not be familiar to you, but that is uh, a baby, baby doll um, sheep. And baby doll has been the most successful wine brand on the east coast of Australia on premise in the last sort of 12 months or so. Quite extraordinary. Um, Yeelands Wines in Marlborough uh, use these miniature sheep um, to graze under vines. They don't actually do any damage to the camp. So you might look at that and see and all what a story, but uh, you know, I think it demonstrates very well the principle of um, telling a complex story in a way that is straightforward and people can identify with emotionally. Um, almost everything has been done with different grape varieties, but I think the real opportunity is in how grape varieties piggyback um, one another into market. Um, believe it or not, Australia is producing some of the best red wine in the world. Um, the Americans don't believe that at the moment and believe that Shiraz is something different to what it is today. Uh, and the real opportunity for Australians to get back into the US market, I think, is through blends, um, blends with Grenache and other Southern Rome varietals. Um, then I think you really will see some of the best wines in the world. And Australians are going to have to innovate to get back into that market. Um, now, I love this picture here. I mean, so many winemakers I know have got an egg in the corner of their winery that's actually filled with water, you know, just for show. I think if you're, if you're going to do something that's revolutionary as far as your fermentation techniques or other ways of wine making, do it on a big scale. Don't do like McWilliams do. McWilliams are a large Australian winery where the project is called your B side. Make it your A side. You know, get, once you know the concept works, I think go for it. Otherwise, you know, it'll never stick. Um, and for those of you that have written off the whole orange wine movement, well, I think there has been a lot of bad wine made. But what we're seeing is that there are serious producers that are incorporating these components or these winemaking styles now. So, you know, I think there's still a lot of room left in terms of experimenting with that sort of winemaking. Uh, but I think the real future, as far as Mediterranean um, places go, and this includes California, South parts of California, um, South Africa, and much of Southern Australia, um, for too long these places have been trying to make uh, white varietals. You know, you can think of you know, Napa Valley Sauvignon Blanc, for example, and it just isn't competitive with cool climate regions. And the answer really is to make Really awesome white blends. I love this one. This is from Ibn Sadi, who's pretty much recognised as one of the best wine producers in South Africa. And I love the symbolism again, how they've used the grape harvester there that's now a, a new home for the birds and the bees and the animals and so forth. But I also love that he's called it sequio. Now, sequio is a Latin word meaning an arid, dry place of great purity. 
Now, I think this is really clever because you know the cool climate people have really tried to own pure you know, over the last 10 or 15 years. I think there is something a whole lot more possible, achievable, true, um, clever blending than what you've ever seen. Single bridal white wine. And to a certain extent, that's true of red, and, and it is well understood in the US with it. But I really think what you need to be looking for is a different, different um, per se. And what I absolutely love about what Oren Swift are doing is they've transcended the whole world as wine as part of gastronomy or as some sort of image device or something that you collect into the world of art. In other words, something that you think about where you derive enjoyment from, you know, trying to understand what the winemaker is doing with all the complex components that put in their wine. So that's a completely different deal using it as, say, Blue the State over in Market River Hat or Luton Rothschild Hat, where it's sort of image building through association to where it's an enjoyable intellectual experience. And I can see a lot more people having a lot more success with that type of approach at this level. The other great innovators of recent time, I think, have been the Provencal. And you know, everybody in the US knows what a screaming success Provencal Rosé has been in that market. The same in the UK, the same in Australia. Um, and what I love about what they're doing, if you went to the Expo this year, you would see now that practically every rosé in France is one colour. Uh, and they've also managed to work out how to stop that colour degenerating. So they've really gotten what the most important message is for this wine. It's got a look to you. Uh, but the other thing that they've done is they've worked so much structure in it that uh, I was able to drink uh, this one most enjoyably with uh, a plate of char-grilled uh, sardines and ratatouille um, last time I was uh, in the Provence region. So some really um, clever work there. But what I love most of all as a wine business consultant is people who actually innovate their whole um, route to market and cash flow model. And the Austrian wine industry has certainly done that. I mean, the Austrian wine industry was pretty much wiped out overnight when they found glycerin and glycol in the wine back in the early 80s. It took them a good 20 years to really start to recover. Uh, but what they've done is that through only launching in new markets at very high prices, they've been able to decrease their volume sales whilst increasing revenue. If you want to see cash start pouring into your business, uh, and that really is a model. So what is overdrive in this context? Well, I think A, number one, challenge everything all the time. You know, um, Richard uh, Branson is a, a, a billionaire because everything that is more or less organized, like your airline, you want to hear that now, your hotel room, your telecommunications company, the music industry, whatever, is more or less stupid. So as so long as you keep asking why, why not do it in a way that makes more sense, you're bound to have success. Now the book Blue Ocean Strategy, I recommend that you read it, there's a whole chapter in there in Yellowtail, which is interesting reading. It talks about four principles, but I think you can crunch them down to two. You either want to reduce or get rid of everything that's not adding value, and you want to amplify or add on everything that is, until you find yourself with a better offer. And if you're wondering where to focus, well, to me, there's really no choice. You focus first on where your high-value customers are and in high-value growth segments in high-value markets, i.e. the entire US over $20 segment currently. Uh, but the big thing for me is always, always, always focus on profits and not cases. And cases are important. Um, cases focus on volume really was the cause of the ruination of the Australian wine industry um, to this point. Uh, it will recover. Um, but I think the best thing to be doing is that you, you need to be creating barriers to entry. And Rioja provides one of the best examples of a massive oversupply in cheap Spanish booths, but um, very, very hard for anybody else anywhere uh, to copy Rioja. No, no, no bank would give you the money. Um, age the wines the way that they do. So um, those things are me. Well, that, that's the show, folks. If you've got um, any questions, 
pretty happy um, to uh, answer them. Thanks, Peter, for the great presentation. Uh, and yeah, we'd like to open up the room to some Q&A. So if anybody has any questions, just please put them in the chat and we'll, we'll go over them one by one. I've got a question for you, Peter, while people think maybe. Um, I, I really liked the, you know, the whole biodynamic organic side and the, and the using of animals. Do you see any sort of novel ways to, it's sort of been, it's been used, right? Just being green, putting green as sort of a thing or organic as your label has been used. What are some really sort of novel ways of approaching that side of uh, the market? Talk through what your principles are, and then following through your website, your social media communications. So that that's always sitting in the background, and from there you can sort of slowly build up what it actually means, why it's actually real, why you um, need to believe. Um, in this brand, and then that's got to be evident right the way through everything that you're doing. But if you start by something that everybody can easily understand, like that picture of the birds and the animals and the grape harvester, um, then people really get what you're on about. Um, and you know, when I look at different wineries that have really taken the principle to the extreme, it's showing people the way that. Um, grapes are picked, you know, by hand and hand sorted, and um, showing people um, you know, biodynamic. The manure going in the cow horn <laughs> in those special moments during the year they're important to the biodynamic cycle. I've just got a question here. Do I think the quality of wine is prevalent? Well, I think it's exactly the same as food. I mean, I took one of my clients out to lunch the other day, and you know, Australian food and UK food at the moment, uh, for the first time ever, is heavily influenced um, by the US. Uh, and so things like corn dogs and full pork buns and all the rest of it are very, very fashionable right now. But the quality of what you're getting compared to, you know, our burger or a hot dog or whatever that you might have got um, 10 years ago has gone completely through the roof. And I think wine is pretty much the same, you know. 10 or 15 years ago, you'd, you'd pay your $20 for your bottle of wine and you'd get something that was adequate, that would express its varietal well enough, um, that would be technically sound. Um, that at very best would be a little bit interesting. Now, now you're getting um, so much more packed into wine in, in a similar way. Um, so I, I see the quality of wine going on leaps and bounds. And the biggest threat to a, Australia or and, and to American wine for that matter is what's happened in terms of wine quality in Europe. I mean, everybody pretty much knows that the Appalachian controlled stuff is now a consistent quality. But the real revolution is what is happening with some of the commercial wine as well. So yeah, I, I see wine quality forever going up and competition always getting tougher. And that's just reality, I think, for most uh, wine. Um, and I've got a question here. Do I have any information on you know, trends uh, with new platforms, etc.? Um, one hour delivery and all the rest of it. Yeah, I mean, I watch it all the time and I watch some of the promises that Amazon and, other and others are making. I think that's really important. It depends you know, on the market as to what you can do. Uh, one of my clients operates a business out of Auckland, New Zealand. And if you live in the part of the country uh, that is the top of the North Island of New Zealand, where around about two thirds of people live all together, uh, they can get you a bottle of wine that day. Um, so that's a different market, you know, people that are in a hurry, uh, to the normal customer ordering online. 
Um, I think it will become more about convenience, but I think there's two distinct markets here. There's people that just want the wire and then are happy to get it in two, three, five days' time, and people who want something special and they want it quickly. Um, there are people that provide those solutions as well. They've got to be commercially viable. It was a delivery service um, in San Francisco where they were delivering on a Vespa uh, a glass of um, any wine you want, pretty much right up to New Tom Rothschild. Uh, but of course, you know, that ultimately wasn't sustainable. Do we have any more questions? Start from the uh, I don't think so. Um, it looks like we're all done. Uh, thank you so much for your time, Peter. It was really, really informative presentation on uh, some interesting stuff. Um, uh, here at BTN, we'd just like to extend our thanks for all the time that you spent preparing this and presenting it to our to our members.